So I get to deliver what I call the, the bad news, and Wayman gets to come up and explain how he is going to help fix all of the bad news, but I have to deliver all of the stuff that doesn't uh, necessarily work out so well. So we're gonna look at long-term returns for both real estate. Um, we've had a lot of clients wanting to get our view, even though we have never invested in individual housing or condos uh, in Canada or in the US, taking a look at the housing situation in Canada and how much of it might be a bubble. Eventually, interest rates are going to be rising uh, more than they have so far. The question is really, what does this do to real estate and other asset classes? And finally, I just want to wrap up with a case study that we've gone through to take a look at the impact of rising rates on a particular asset. What might it do to the returns, both from a cash flow perspective and from a return perspective? So real estate is an asset class. Our overall asset allocation for real estate is typically around 15%. It ranges from 3 to 30%, depending on the client. Um, roughly about 20% of that capital is in real estate trusts. But the other 80% is directly invested in two private LPs, uh, one in Canada, one in the US. And we've been doing limited partnerships in real estate since um, uh, 2000. So our first investment was a very small shopping center in a suburb of Victoria. You wouldn't exactly call it an A shopping center. It would be a stretch to call it a B shopping center. You know, it was uh, an $8.3 million investment with 20 people putting up $100,000. It was sort of like, kind of, just whoever wanted to come into it, we said, let's try to see if we can make this work. And uh, as of uh, uh, last week, we now have about $750 million in between, divided between the two LPs. So it's grown a fair bit since then. I wanted to share this slide. I, I don't exactly know how I was thinking about this, uh, but I, I remember something uh, maybe from, I don't know, Bible class when I was 10. I was always into numbers even back then. That the, it talked about how money should be invested. And the allocations were one third into real estate, one third into business, and one third into reserves, which back then would have been gold. And 3,000 years later, this gentleman, Nathan Rothschild, marginally changed that model so the business investment became securities. He would basically lend money to any country that he felt would absolutely decide to pay him back. So he lent to the English as opposed to the French during the Napoleonic Wars. And he put a third into art. But he kept his 33 and a third percent interest in real estate, in that case land. So in a lot of ways, you know, the, the asset allocation model, this asset allocation model, by the way, is used by a number of advisors today in terms of how they run their clients' portfolios. And if you take a look at uh, one particular group, Tiger 21 is a group of re retired business owners typically. They have, to get into the club, you have to pay $30,000 a year to get advice from the other members as a peer group. You need 10 million of investable assets to start with. And this is the latest asset allocation model for this particular group. You can see that the allocation of real estate is about 20%. There's even more going into private equity, and public equities are about the same. They have other areas of hedge funds and fixed income, but it's very interesting to take a look at these allocations because they're so much greater in terms of real estate and private equity than the majority of people will have in their portfolio and so much lower exposure to public equities. If you want to take a look at how the last 40 years has gone, this is the uh, returns for real estate in the US, and the two things to notice are this, that the returns are less than equity. So I think it's important for us to say here, we're agnostic when it comes to how people should invest their money. You know, our clients are paying us to try to recommend the right asset classes. So we don't have a bias against public equities in any way. What we're looking at here, though, is the fact that the public equities, the S&P 500, has a higher return over 40 years than real estate. Uh, by about 1.4% a year, but it is also 40% higher volatility. And that's a significant increase in risk for a smaller increase in returns. So there's an organization that's been around a long time called IPD, and they measure a different kind of real estate return. One of the problems with real estate in public markets, when you buy REITs, for example, is REITs 
are in pretty well in all cases 100% managed in real estate, but the, but the volatility of the REITs is such that, for instance, from 2007 to 2009, REITs dropped in Canada by 70% in terms of overall pricing for the entire index, even though actively traded real estate only dropped 10% in that same time frame. So this is a, a, a review of the returns of real estate for hard asset investors, mainly large institutions um, all over the world. So this is their global index. What you're looking at here in the green, these are the cash income returns on the real estate for the last roughly 18 years. And then in the red, what you're looking at is the capital appreciation of the real estate or the loss of the real estate in any given year. Now, if you take a look at the income side, you'll see that the income changes no more than 3% from its highest to its lowest. The income is very predictable, but the capital value of the real estate has a range of almost 26%. So the, the thing you can't do with real estate is predict what the future price is going to be, but you can have a much better chance of predicting what the future cash flow is going to be. And in Canada, when we look at the Canadian numbers, we're not as volatile as the other jurisdictions. Um, so the annual return range is still anywhere from minus 6 to plus 18. That's still a pretty big range. Uh, far less than stocks, maybe, but still a pretty big range. But always positive cash flow. And so that's what makes income-producing real estate unique as a proposition when we compare it to just looking at publicly traded equities.